Um, up next is um, George. Uh, George. Craig Reznovski. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Marty. Um, George in a past life, maybe. There's a few people keep saying, oh, Nick, when they meet me. So maybe it was Nick in a past life as well. But anyway, um, but in this life, it's Greg, and the surname's Reznovski, and um, that's a large Polish name. It's got 13 letters in it. It starts with R, the second letter Z. And it's like, mm, how do you get your tongue around that? Um, and um, the Greg Full Moon thing came around because in 2005 I entered a, uh, or uh, undertook a creative writing course and um, I needed to um, submit my, my um, essays and stuff like that um, via email and so that forced me into the computer age. Um, so that's had a large bearing on me being a researcher and looking at all these things and arriving here some 10 years later. So, just to give that some sort of background. Um, and in the course of that investigation, um, I've looked at a lot. I've looked at some of the elements that um, Marty's been referencing. I've had a look at um, how the banksters uh, direct traffic around the, the planet. I've had a look at um, what we're doing in terms of our industrial pollution uh, with the planet in terms of climate change. And that got me into a small environment group in Mochawaka called the Renewables. And um, so it's, it's a bunch of people that were brought together by two grandmothers in Mochawaka. And uh, they were very concerned about what we were doing and what sort of planet and land we were leaving for uh, their young ones and the ones that follow them and the ones that follow them. And um, they got some people around them um, and they, they, we, the renewables, meet uh, Wednesdays, uh, each Wednesday, and have a discussion about what we can do to advance up raising awareness and thinking about things in relationship to all of this. And um, we have a shared meal, and um, we carry on and be activist and proactive in trying to get governments to do what they should be doing, right, instead of what they're currently doing. What they should be doing is looking after our interests. Right. Um, they don't appear to be doing that from the point of view of what's going on in the world. We've known about that climate change issue for quite a while now. I mean, there's a lot of hoo-ha and scepticism about it, but ultimately the scientists have all come to agreement that's, you know, we're supposed to have science-based uh, policy settings in respect to... You know, based on evidence, we do this because we know it's going to have that result for our benefit. So the evidence is, is that climate change, our industrial pollutions and everything are causing our planet to warm up and yet our politicians aren't doing things to fix that problem. Why? Large corporations won't let them. Large corporations' interests are that they can keep selling us polluting cars and buses and still have smokestacks that belch stuff and all the rest of it, right, rather than moving on and being forceful and publicly interested in their policy settings. And I'll draw an illustration. In Australia currently, the Australian government is being sued by a large tobacco manufacturer called Philip Morris. Now that is taking place under the investment state dispute settlement uh, arrangements that are in a free trade and investment agreement between Australia and Hong Kong. Philip Morris was so keen to take that dispute against Australia because of Australia's publicly interested legislation, legislating for plain packaging of tobacco products, that they shifted an office into Hong Kong so that they could access that agreement in order to sue the Australian government. Australia legislated in 2012 and funnily enough we are also doing the same thing in respect to our smoke-free 2025 policy which if you recall was an agreement between the Maori Party and the National Party uh, in terms of uh, giving the National Party uh, confidence for supply uh, in the, out of the 2011 election and the government agreed to put in place smoke-free um, smoke 25, which involved plain packaging of tobacco products. 
Now, this isn't just something that's sort of like a flight of fancy that someone just dreamed up. It's actually an international convention under the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization, this is the first convention in respect to public health that it's actually initiated and got agreement on. Something like 50 odd countries have signed on to the Tobacco Control Convention. It requires governments to take all reasonable measures to put these things in place to reduce the uptake of cigarette smoking by our young'uns. Right. Now in 2012, our Prime Minister, John Key, he said to us that, like on the public record, that there, there was no free trade and investment agreement that would stop New Zealand from entering or putting this legislation in place. Now, between 2012 and 2014, we didn't enter into a free trade and investment agreement, okay? But in 2014, after the first reading of that bill, he parked it and said, we're going to hold and wait and see what happens with the Australian case, okay? Now, last year, under urgency, that same government, our government, moved the Countering Terrorist Fighters Legislation Bill. Okay? So it was about, oh, we're really concerned about what's happening in Syria and we don't want people from New Zealand going over there under New Zealand passports and joining ISIS and fighting uh, against um, whatever's going on over there. It's very hard to work out what is going on over there, but anyway. So that bill was moved under urgency, right? And effectively, it was another incursion into all of our civil rights. They moved that under urgency. Right? We've got a public health measure in terms of tobacco and we're going to park it and we're going to wait and see. So just based on actions, you can see where the government, what the government values and what it doesn't value. If it moved under the urgency to put that legislation in place, the, the Tobacco Control Convention, our Smoke Free 2025, right, and did it now, Right, then we've got, instead of waiting another year or two while this ISDS case carries out in Australia, then that's another year or two that we have right, slowed down the uptake of cigarette smoking by our youngers, public health. Yeah. It would also say to the world that we're not really here to protect corporate interests, we're here to look after the people that live in New Zealand. Right? Because moving you under urgency and the New Zealand making a declaration, we'd actually be helping our friends in Australia who are facing this suit. Philip Morris is asking for $2 billion or so. Right? Now, this is the sort of thing that governments are facing under the investor state dispute settlement uh, arrangements that are being put in place in these free trade and investment agreements. New Zealand has already signed up to a couple. The China free trade agreement that everyone talks about as being so wonderful has that provision in it. The Taiwan agreement that we've signed up to has that in it. A Hong Kong agreement that we have has that in it. And there's maybe one or two others. The most recently, New Zealand has just before a Christmas announced that we have finalised negotiations in the New Zealand-Korea free trade agreement. And that was signed John Key took a special trip over to Seoul, Korea, and signed it, I think, on the 23rd, so that must have been Monday. Okay. And signing an agreement like that is a formal process which starts a train. Okay. And I might just explain now what that process is, just so you've got a bit of a picture. Okay. So a free trade agreement, it's negotiated, so our negotiators are the... Um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and their Trade Negotiations Division. Okay? So they would set up discussions with the other parties. So if it's a bilateral agreement, it's between two. If it's a multilateral agreement, it's three or more. Okay? TPP is a multilateral agreement between 12. I haven't got enough fingers. Um, and the uh, Korea agreement is bilateral, it's two. Okay? So They've had negotiations going on for something like five years. They've finalised them back in November or December. Um, we started to see the content of it just before Christmas. 
and they've signed it now, what happens next? Okay, so in signing it, the government or the government minister has done two things. One, he's agreed that the content, the words that are written down in the agreement are accurate and accurately reflect what was in the agreement. And we in New Zealand have a precedent for disagreement about what's in an agreement too, don't we? A treaty, an international treaty. Like in 1840, right, the people of New Zealand entered into an agreement with the Crown, right, which we all know as the Treaty of Waitangi. Okay? And the Crown facilitated um, a Maori language version and an English language version. And funnily enough, they didn't meet up. All right? So the Maori side of the agreement or treaty, I mean, a treaty is a contract, you know, it's like it should, needs to be taken very seriously what's, what's in it. So that side of it, right, said that Maori retained their sovereignty, right, in terms of running their own affairs. The English side suggests that they gave it up. It's only recently that the that the Waitangi Tribunal said that the Maori side, because that's what they were agreeing to, is the one that should be understood as being the law. Okay? So with the treaty, the, um, the international treaty between New Zealand and Korea, we need to make sure that the English version lines up with the Korean, right? They've got different sorts of alphabet. It looks totally different. So it needs to make sure that it all lines up because it's a legal document and the, what lawyers do is they take things apart and find ways to make money out of finding differences or loopholes and things like that. So it's important that it all gets lined up. So the first thing they do is make sure that the words line up. Everyone understands what's in the agreement. And the second thing they do is, is they undertake to use their good offices or the good offices of the government to get the thing assented to. And it's formal assent where the government says, yes, we're agreeing to this treaty or not giving assent, we don't agree. Now, in respect to um, uh, these treaties, um, it is given to the public to think that it's the parliament that ratifies the treaty. Okay? That's not the case. Under treaties in New Zealand law and New Zealand convention, it is the Crown that retains the right or the prerogative to enter into treaties. Okay? And the tr Crown exercises that right through the executive okay, of the government. And the executive of the government is the Cabinet here in New Zealand. So it's Cabinet that makes the decision. So 20 good men and a couple of women um, make that decision on behalf of the whole of New Zealand and funnily enough New Zealand doesn't get to ask get asked what's in it okay your representatives in Parliament they get to have a look at it but they can't alter anything that's in it all they can do is agree or otherwise to put in place enabling legislation to give effect to it because under the conventions, New Zealand right, can't make the treaty work until it's fully implemented and legislation that's required is put in place. Okay? So our parliament will be asked to give assent to this thing right, by way of passing legislation, but they won't be asked for a vote on it. Okay? So that goes for the New Zealand Korea Free Trade Agreement, which we've currently got before us, and also the larger TPP, which is the one that we're very concerned about. Right. Very concerned about. Okay. So that maybe cover a little bit of the procedure. Um, with respect to um, the content, um, there's a whole lot of things that are being negotiated and only a small number of the 29 chapters within it are actually relate to trade. Okay. Um, a lot of it is uh, about stuff that's behind our border and the border of the other 11 nations that are participating in this. And what they're saying to us is that what they want to do is they want to homogenise the rules whereby 
goods and services are exchanged between the 12 participating nations. And so a, for instance, tube of toothpaste made in Vietnam, right, and approved in Vietnam would then be okay for use in New Zealand with no added need to look at it, right, because it's already been approved by a proper regulatory authority. Now that may be okay as far as toothpaste is concerned, but then we've also got the larger concern that a number of people were concerned about last evening where we were addressed by um, eminent people talking about GMOs, genetic engineering, and particularly in respect to our food. And in respect to TPP, it is saying that food, irrespective of how it's derived, whether it's organic, conventionally grown, or GMO, or whatever else they might dream up tomorrow, right, they're saying that they are all equivalent. So if it looks like a carrot and it's orange when you break it inside, that's it, that's a carrot. It doesn't matter how we came to that particular carrot, they are equivalent and there should not be any restrictions on carrots being freely traded amongst the TPP nations. Okay? Now we have now in New Zealand laws in relationship to labelling of um, GMOs on, in our food. Right? We heard last night that some of those are being flouted. Right? They're not being religious in their application in respect to those laws. I mean, they're religious in their application when you've not got your seatbelt on when you're driving down the road, or they're religious in their application if you do a little bit more than 50 k's in a 50 k zone. They're religious in your application on a whole number of other issues, but they're not religious in their application in respect to checking and making sure that we, our food um, fits to the legislation. Now, under TPP, it would be very difficult, under the terms that we understand that will be in it, to maintain our GMO-free food. And in effect, we don't have GMO-free food if you guys are meat eaters, because currently a lot of animal feeds that are imported into New Zealand that are corn or soy-based and others, canolas, would be probably GMO, particularly if they come from the States, where, excuse me, most of those crops are in fact GMO and Argentina, yeah, like where they come from, yeah. So, <clears throat> so there's a number of concerns there in respect to things like intellectual property. Um, one, when they first devised copyright law in respect to like books and authorship and things like that and, and invention, the original copyright law period was the age of the author plus 14 years. That was a couple of hundred years ago. Now, over the course of time, right, this industry has grown up whereby the authors don't have much control over their property, their intellectual property. They, they get horrible contracts that they have to sign in respect to their work in order to get it published. Effectively, it's publishing houses and others, large monopolies that, or large corporations that get control of that. And they've extended copyright law now to its, an author's death plus 50 years. Right? I mean, once that period's expired, then anyone can get hold of the text of that book and reproduce it. You can even like repackage it in your own cover and all the rest of it and sell it in the marketplace. Now they want to in increase copyright out to 70 plus years. And some of those things probably have already been agreed in their content by the parties because these negotiations have been going on for like five years, right, since 2008, um, so more than five years, and a lot of things that are in it, as we understand it, have been agreed. And we've seen earlier intellectual property leaks, we've seen earlier environment uh, chapter leaks, and we've seen, and most recent, and we've seen earlier investment chapter leaks, and most recently, just in the last few days, as luck would have it, we've seen another uh, intellectual, pro uh, another um, investment chapter leak, um, which people can access. Uh, 
in the mainstream media. It's being carried. It's on the It's Our Future website. Uh, you can see the website. It's on that pamphlet that most of you people have in front of you. And I would encourage you to go there and have a little browse around and have a look what's in there. Also, just generally, if you don't just trust one source, and that's got many sources in it, just Google TPP generally and have a look. Um, you can also go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, MFAT, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and have a look on their website at the list of free trade and investment agreements that were either negotiated and agreed and have in place, or that uh, are under negotiation. And the ones that are agreed, you can then go and click on them and read the content and have a look at lots of things in relationship to it, if you've got hours and hours and hours to do that. <laughs> And I, unfortunately, unfortunately, fortunately, whatever, but like most of us are busy, right? Like most of us are busy. Like, you know, life gets increasingly stressful. There's lots of demands on our time and things like that. And it becomes very difficult for each of us to go down every rabbit hole and find out everything that's going on. So there's a certain amount of trust and, and you get people like us to come along or me to come along and... And I guess there's, a, there's an element of trust in terms of I'm offering something that's um, credible to you and, and up front and straight. And, um, but I would encourage people to go and check it out for themselves so that they appreciate it all themselves. Okay? Because it is true that there is something like 3,000 bilateral investment agreements now operating in the world. We luckily only have a few. And... All of those, or most of those, will have investor state dispute settlement in it. And if you go back like 20 or so years ago, there wasn't too many of these um, suits, lawsuits, under investor state dispute settlement. Right? There wasn't too many of those then. In fact, there would seem to be a general industry moving where they have parties of developing countries coming to a meeting looking for development money and World, uh, World Trade Organisation representatives would be saying, oh, well, we can link you up and you up with, an invest in, with a free trade and investment agreement and if you sign up to that, well, then we can then give you the cheque for further development and you get a loan and it's not very much interest, don't worry about that. And um, people get signed up to it and now we've got a situation where there's something in excess of... I don't know, 600 different investment state dispute settlement cases being run, often by first world countries against third world countries or developing nations. Okay. So this is really, it's, um, it's, a very, um, it's a very blunt and arbitrary action that people or corporations are taking against governments in, in other nations but also in Western world as well, like with the tobacco um, suit against Australia. And, um, and it's about, and, and that has two effects. One, it gets money into the corporate um, corporation's pocket, but it also makes government, like if someone sues you for something, like just think about it yourself, someone's threatening a suit, okay? Okay, um, I'm going to chop off the limb of the tree or something because it's in my way. Now I'm going to sue you about that. Oh, what's that mean? <laughs> Can I get away with it? Blah, blah. Okay, so with government, right, who are increasingly uh, faced with difficulty in budgeting, all of them run deficits now. If they want more money, it's invariably they have to borrow it from the banksters, right, because that's all been tied up in a monopoly also. Okay. And so if, if, if a corporation comes to the government and is suing it, the government, on average, with every investor state dispute settlement case, on average needs to pay out $8 million in costs just to run the case, let alone what the outcome is. Okay, um, okay so in Canada, for instance, in, in the St. Lawrence Valley, um, uh, people there were very concerned because the government, which was the Quebec uh, province, was opening up the valley for oil uh, uh, prospecting and they were um, looking to drill right, and frack 
right, in order to get the oil and gas out of the valley. Now, people in that area didn't like that and they kicked up to the point that the Quebec government put in place a two-year moratorium on that back in maybe 2011 or 12. The, but the corporation, which was a US corporation, and Canada, the US and uh, Mexico right, are part of NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, okay? Lone Pine Industries, or whatever it's called, the corporation is American, it's covered, its investment's covered in, in, in Canada. It said you're stuffing up our investment, Canada, and so it's suing the Canadian government for $250 million. Now we've got the same situation here in New Zealand in respect to the oil industry prospecting around Taranaki, but they're moving over uh, in towards Gisborne, they're moving into the Wairapa. I'm not sure what the situation is around here in terms of shale. Okay, if you've got shale, you're likely to have oil, and if you've got shale and oil, then, then someone's gonna be interested in drilling, but drill baby drill, and frack, frack, frack. Now, um, a really good website to look at there is um, brr, climate, Hang on, just, it'll come to me and I'll tell you in a moment afterwards, I'll just keep moving on. But it's the people over in Taranaki who are fighting this and they've got heaps of resources. Uh, Climate Justice Taranaki. I knew if I kept talking it would pop back into the mind, but Climate Justice Taranaki. And um, um, they've, got some, they've got scientific people, they've got um, professional people in different areas who are providing lots of evidence and also monitoring the situation there. And they're sharing this information because really they're a test case for what happens in the rest of the New Zealand in respect to uh, drilling for oil on land, let alone what the issue is with oil offshore. Okay. So corporations are using these things as a mechanism to direct government policy. Okay. And this is a problem because corporations don't vote. Who votes? None of you voted in 20th of September? Huh? Yeah, that's right. People vote, right? They're part of the democracy. Okay, so the, the, the thing is, is about people voting for the government that's going to serve their purpose and do things to look after their interests. Otherwise, why would you participate? Right? Like, if you're not going to get any value out of the thing or they're not going to look after your interests, why participate? One million people on the 20th of September didn't participate. Wow. Right? Now, now you, people might say, oh, they're apathetic and all the rest of it, but that may not be fair. Right? Because some of us might kick ourselves for voting and wasting our vote uh, in this chook raffle, right, which doesn't actually give us a good outcome. Okay? I mean, some of those people that didn't vote, they might be more shrewd, you know, like they're not giving consent to the game. Okay? But it's probably important that we do get involved. It would be good to bring them in, but somehow we have to get the policies that we want, right, that we support, that look after our interests, implemented. Right? So this is what this exercise is about in respect to TPP. We're not too worried about which government's in power, providing the government does what we want. Okay. Okay. So with TPP okay, and the renewables, I'll just go back now and just tell you a little bit of a story. I'll just give you, that was a bit of an idea about what TP is about, but now I might just give you a bit of a story about how we come to be here in Tauranga having a chat to you this afternoon. So the renewables looked at TPP and said, well, what can we do about it? Well, in December 2012, the Auckland um, Council had been looking at TPP. Um, and it was interesting because the TPP negotiators, they move around and they, they go and, and take over a big convention centre somewhere for a week or two weeks in various nice locations around the world, most recently in Hawaii, right? just um, uh, on, in March, the week of just after our rally. And, um, but this time it was Auckland, okay? So they were, there, they were there early in December. 
But back in October of um, 2012, the Auckland Council's Economic uh, Committee, Economic Forum, uh, heard representations from Stephen Jacoby, who's the, um, the guy that fronts the New Zealand USA Economic Partnership Forum. So there's this club, right, that meets twice yearly, right, once in, Australia, in New Zealand, once in, in the USA, and they're talking about how they can facilitate and look after the interests of business, right, and trade and all that sort of thing. And it was funny. It was them that were meeting in Christchurch when the Christchurch um, um, earthquake happened, right? That's, that was what was going on there. And it was probably them that the Israelis in their little van, right, were spying on when they got squashed under the earthquake as well, okay? So the conspiracies and all the rest about why they might be there, you probably don't have to go much further than that most simple answer, okay? All right. So... Auckland was um, looking at TPP, they had Stephen Jacoby, they had David Walker from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade explaining why TPP is a good reason, for, good thing for New Zealand, and they also had a presentation from Jane Kelsey, who is the brains, if you like, behind It's Our Future. Right? She's a law professor at Auckland University, and she's been on the case of the free trade and investment agreements and the neoliberal agenda. All right? for many, many years. She's written many books on it, and really what we're facing, or she's been the prophet that's seen all this stuff coming along and talking to us about it, and it's all coming to fruition, and here we are. So um, Auckland Council considered it, and then they adopted a policy, right, a public interest policy that had 12 points of public interest in it. Okay? So it's saying that we want to look after our environment, we want to make sure that the trade is done on a fair basis, we want to look after the environment, um, uh, we want to look after labour rights, we want to make sure that government can still procure as it needs to. Um, we definitely don't want investor-state dispute settlement. Uh, anyway, there's 12 points. Now, they adopted that position, and it was interesting because um, the renewables, right, we saw that and then soon after that Jane Kelsey came down to Nelson and did a public meeting in Nelson and um, she presented that to the public meeting and so activists in Nelson took that up and pushed that through the Nelson Council in July of 2013, okay. Now, from there, we the renewables, okay, we got very active and um, particularly myself, and we then lobbied and pushed it through the Tasman District Council, okay? And we finally succeeded after a, a six-month project in getting that agreed to them by them in March of last year, 6th of March. And then from that we said, well, how can we spread it from there, right? So we had Auckland, Nelson, Tasman. So then uh, I spent a lot of time writing, that seems to be what I do, um, and I wrote a letter to every council in New Zealand. So there's 78 councils, like there's the, uh, there's the territorial authorities and then there's the regional councils, so there's 78 in all. And we wrote to them and we asked them all to consider our, that same 12-point TPP policy, both in respect to their annual plans and in, in their forums of their council. Now, of course, they all wrote back and said, yes, no worries, you know. That was a joke too. <laughs> okay. Right, it's not that simple. And so what happened was is um, uh, some of them said, oh, we take that on note. Others said, oh, that's none of our business. That's central government stuff. Right? Because, right, you know, we don't want to really get involved in that even though it's going to impact everyone in our communities, that's not our business, <coughs> right? Okay, so we don't take no for an answer and we started working. And it also happened that um, Murray Horton, Murray Horton from Kafka, Campaign Against Foreign Control of Aotearoa, he was doing a, his election tour that year and in May he moved through the North Island I met him in Nelson when he was through there in April and then I asked him whether I could tag along 
and talk to people about TPP at the end of each of his lectures. And so he did about 20 different locations in the North Island. And so I came to meet Marty and, and people over in Opotiki and Whakatane and up in Kaitaia and Auckland and Gisborne and Napier and Palmerston North and Wellington. And, and it happened to be that while I was in Wellington, uh, it was the first occasion where our uh, one of the council I happened to be where the council one of the councils was having their uh, public hearings in respect to their annual plan. It was the Hutt City Council, so I lobbed into the Hutt City Council 28th or 29th of May and said, "Hi, I'm Greg. Da 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 da. We wrote to you. Here it is," and gave them a couple of pages of stuff, delivered it um, with a very serious eye, you know, lots of eye contact, the mayor and that. And before I'd even finished it. Mayor Ray Wallace, right, of Hutt City Council, um, said, all right, we'll, we'll look at this. <laughs> you don't need to talk anymore. And it went away. I said, oh, no worries. And then I wrote to him and said, well, let us know. And, you know, that's all good. And then I carried on back down to, because I come from Mochawaka, and I carried back over there. And I had business um, down there because I had to talk to councils down there, Huranui District Council's Youth Council. Um, and then Gore, I went down to Gore and spoke to the Gore Council in respect to their annual plan hearings. And then while I was there, I knocked on the Invercargill City Council and talked to Melissa Short. And out of that, I got an invitation to talk to their youth council in August. And, and, you know, and then I came back to Christchurch and kept working because we were setting up more Kafka meetings down there. And from there, I went up to Nelson to the uh, local government New Zealand uh, annual conference. And, in July, and we spoke there, and then we went and while there, David Cunliffe was there and had a public meeting of Nelson people, and out of that we wrote to the Labor Party and said, this stuff that Auckland's carried and Nelson's carried and Tasman's carried, that policy with the 12 points in it, that's exactly the same as your policy, um, policy uh, remit number 35 that they carried in 2012. They carried two policies about TPP. Okay. Remit 34 and remit 35. The second one is exactly this policy. I said, do you stand by that? We stood up in the meeting and said, David, do you stand by this? Uh, rum, rum. <laughs> right. When we wrote to him, like three page letter, nicely laid out, congratulating him on a great speech and all the rest of it? No answer. Most recently, I've just written to um, Andrew Little, the new leader, me and Graham O'Brien, the guy that kicked it off down in Nelson. Right. So, you know, I'll come back to that in a moment, right, just in terms of the story. So anyway, so with all of this work, I went and spoke to Clutherk Council, like, and in Christchurch, TPP Action there had it on the agenda, 14th of August, we had our next council. Christchurch City Council carried it unanimously. A few days later, we were in Dunedin, and Dunedin City Council, after a lengthy debate, uh, and the mayor had to vote twice, because it was a tied vote, and he used his casting vote, and Mayor Dave Cull voted for us, and voted for the people and our 12-point policy. And then, uh, I was invited to come up and speak with, um, to the Wellington City Council in, at the end of August, 27th I think it was, and, um, and from there I stayed in Wellington for four months, um, just working, public meetings, helping with the rally in November, um, putting papers before councils, like preparing documents, putting before, particularly I was concentrating on that Hutt City Council, kept going back to Hutt City Council, going back. Like, they, <laughs> we put so many posters up around Hutt City that the council has sent us a bill for cleaning them. <laughs> we haven't paid it yet, we're still having a dispute about it, right? <laughs> I think in the lead up to the November 7 rally, I personally put up about a thousand posters around Wellington. Yeah. Well, I, I used to pick, I've picked fruit, I've done all sorts of things, so I can, like, I'm a bit of a machine. So, like, one season I picked 500 bins of fruit, you see, like apples. And, yeah, yeah. So, working is not a problem, so, and it's nice being out there at night time, seeing the street life and all the rest of it. But anyway, it's little stories along the way. Um, so, then, 
ultimately, all of that good work, I disappeared out of the North Island for a while and went down south for a while and came back and Wellington City Council picked it up on the 25th of uh, February. And then our good friends, Mayor Wallace, right, voted for it, along with seven of his councillors against five who voted against it just this week. All right? Okay, so, so that's the seventh council, okay? So that's, okay? And then this, I, I was coming over to Napier Council to talk to their policy committee on Wednesday and then let it be known that I was in the area. Gizzy said, we want you to come and do a public meeting. And then Marty said, I want to be in on this, and so I come over here, right? So that's why I'm here. So it's a bit of a you know, roundabout way of giving you a bit of information about the, the campaign, but also uh, so you appreciate what we're up to. And so this morning, right, we went down to the library, right, because we're keen to get Taranga Council to do the same thing. Who's going to be the eighth? I think. Tauranga won't be the eighth because it, it's probably going to be Upper Hutt, right? Or it might be, Ka or it could be Capity, or it could be Napier even. Right? They're starting to move, like you know the domino effect. Like you get to a certain point and then they're all starting to move. Um, so we're keen there. So we went to the library and there's a couple of councillors there because it's your long-term plan, right? So what is the implications of TPP on the long-term plan? If we're going to be asked to pay more for our stuff, does that throw out their budgets? Because right? they're putting in place a plan for, for their activities, projects for the next 10 years, and they're going to have sort of some round numbers about what the budgets are going to be. I mean, at the same time as all this is going on, there's a review being undertaken by Local Government New Zealand about funding of councils, you know, how our bodies are going to be funded. So these are all things that people need to get their minds around if they want to see AOT Aroa New Zealand going forward looking after people. So as well as being an exercise where we're looking at TPP, this is also an exercise in, if you like, revitalising our democracy. Because the democracy is what? It's a participatory thing, right? And if we're not participating in it, then we leave the field vacant to whoever else is really interested in what government's up to. And I think that, in the last 30 years, is the reason why we have the situation that we have now. We've been distracted by the corporation's toys, right? And while they've been talking to government, we've been playing with all our bits and pieces and getting dazzled by big screens and, and big movies and all the rest of that. So we need to sort of like, Sure, we can still be dazzled and all the rest of it and play with our toys, but we also also got to get some focus back on how we come to drive government policy going forward, right, so that it looks after our interests and so that we don't be poisoning ourselves with our food and everything else. Okay, okay so with Tauranga Council, we spoke to a couple of councillors and out of that, um, we're not just looking at the long-term plan, um, the council has a um, community development meeting on the 14th of August, okay, and it, then it has a further council meeting on the 21st, I'm sorry, not August, um, April, and then it has a further council meeting on the 21st, it's just part of its regular cycle. So, based on that, we're in getting some indications from our discussion with the couple of councillors. So there was, um, uh, oh, Ed? Oh, Ed, Ed, Edwin, Ed, what was the two council? Uh, it's Catherine. Yeah, okay. And we also spoke, and there was an Ian Gooden, Gooden, Gooden there as well, and he, uh, wrong pocket, cards everywhere. Uh, Ian Gooden, Ian Gooden, who's the infrastructure uh, manager, right? Okay, so. And out of that, that was their suggestion and um, to talk to a council meeting and we went for the earliest one, so that's the community development meeting. So, um, so we're preparing a letter and paper to go to that, right? Okay. And I'm going to disappear, I'm going to go to Dunedin for a week over Easter and then I'm going to jump back here and then I'm going to drive Tinkerbell back up here and I might go to Gisborne on the 13th because I've got a, um, a 
public meeting and workshop there and then I'll drive back over here and be at the council meeting and we want you there. All right? So just like you come here to hear this, we need to show the council that there is support in the community for what we're doing. So this is how we participate. All right? All right, we, like, okay, so you've got leaders who will speak on your behalf, right? So I'm fairly eloquent. I'm happy to speak and talk to the council in respect to all of this. But we also, the leader needs to have all the people lined up so that the council understands that it has weight of public opinion, right? Otherwise, it's a very dry exercise and they easily fob us off, right? And so in all of these exercises, like when we were at Hutt City Council, on, um, on Tuesday, we had the public gallery packed so that the council could see that there's lots of different people from within the community who were concerned about all of this. Okay? So we need people to be supporting this by dint of showing up, by dint of signing petitions, by dint of sharing with their mates. Right? Because a democracy is not anyone's democracy, it's our democracy. And the amount that you participate in it is the amount that you own your democracy. All right? Okay. okay. So, <clears throat> so like that's part of the plan for going forward to try and bring Tauranga into the fold of councils who are expressing support for the public in respect to the TPP. And so what we're saying to the council is it is your business to look after our interests. Okay? It is your business. Okay? And, I mean, you've got a conservative council, I guess, it would be one way of describing it. But, but the thing is, and we have to be realists about things, because, like, we can, only, we can only operate in the real world. The fantasy world doesn't work too well, right? Because, you, you know, you come up against brick walls everywhere. You know, you imagine it's not there, but there it is. <laughs> Bang, right? So, um, so the real word is, is we've got to deal with that. And, but the thing is, is that councillors and people who might be even National Party supporters aren't all die-in-the-wall globalists and neoliberals, right? right? Some of them might be just interested in, like, you know, their freedom to make a quid, right? But they don't necessarily want to destroy the world in doing that, and they like to live in communities. So some of them might be what you might call small-c conservatives, right? But, and they would, in their hearts, feel as though they're publicly spirited people. And so an appeal to public interest, which is what we are doing in TPP Action, can have a lot of value, right? And especially as they see, right, the variety of councils, mainly large urban councils at the moment, because we pick off the easier targets, we're not silly, right, like about how we go about doing our business, but they can see like, that there's a mixture of people that have come in and supported what we're doing right, in terms of the council program. Okay. So I'll leave that alone for a moment. And um, Now I've got a few more things to talk to you, so maybe we just do a little bit of a check. Is, does people want to ask questions or something? Or are you happy for me to keep talking? Um, we're not ready for statements yet, just questions, OK? I've got a quick one. Yeah. Hamilton. Yeah. Um, what's happening? Okay, we may, um, I've been for a ticky tour up around that area, so up to Parihaka, New Plymouth, Hamilton, just talking to activists, and we've made approaches to the council, but it's been brushed off, okay? The, another problem council in terms of conservatism, and we, um, we do have people in Raglan, for instance, who are very keen to push it onto the Waikato council over there. Um, it's going to be another concerted effort, okay? Uh, in terms of my energies, now I've gone some bang over here, okay? So I can only be sort of in about three places at once um, and I can't be over there and do what I'm going to be doing for the next foreseeable. So unless they're going to do it themselves, it's just going to have to sit there for a little bit, okay? Sorry, bro. Um, I'll go back to the beginning when you were talking. You said cabinet passes it. Yep. Cabinet's not the government, well, it is, but it's cabinet, not their government. Mm. The national government want to push this through. Yep. The cabinet is going to, and you say no one else can get near that or can't do a thing about it once they pass it, which they want to do, yep. unless we change the government. Is that, would that be correct? Okay, so perhaps I'll come to that next. Okay, I, I can talk to that. Okay. Yeah. 
Because yeah. we have people like Winston Peters. Who yeah, yeah, I know this is very topical, and and that's part of what I want to talk about. Yeah. So I was just I just checking where we're at now in relationship to that. Okay. A couple more questions. Yeah. What time does the uh, sh I think it's one o'clock on the 14th, but um, what we'll, uh, sorry, what we'll do is we'll, um, there's a petition floating around and if your name isn't already on the email list that's about uh, and you're interested in being involved, you, if you can just pass on your email address to, um, there was some petition somewhere, where did they go? I'm not sure. Oh, no, they were just there. Someone's got them, but anyway, we'll collect email addresses so that people can be contacted. Okay, you can you can find it. I think it's. Uh, hang on, I wrote it in my diary. Uh, and uh, I wrote it on my diary. It's all right. It's good. It's good. It's good. Okay. Uh, one o'clock. Sorry. One one o'clock on the foot. One one o'clock, fourteenth of April. Um, that I don't know. Hang on. You don't know. No, because it's um, um, the community develop the community development meetings or committees. They move them around, right, and they put them in different places in the community. So I'm not sure what the actual venue will be, but we will circulate that and get that to people. So, okay. Yeah. Sorry, Tracy. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the idea is that we want them to make it part of their policies and procedures and what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, is there a, a, a desire on our behalf to for them to take it to represent us at national governance level? It, it's, that's, that's what's on that petition. Yeah. But they'll go back to you and say, oh, it's not our business. So what is that connection, let's say, how can we forge that connection? Local governments actually should be speaking to national governments on our behalf. What what is that? Connected? Okay, so I'll take that point and then I'll move on to the thing about the the national thing. And is there anything else? No, that's okay. Right. So the question is is like um, in respect to the resolution, um, what are we expecting local government to do with it, and and how do we make them do what we want them to do with it? Right. So, so with it, um, what once they've adopted it, that becomes their policy. Right. Now, sometimes people adopt policies and then they don't put them into practice. Right. I had a policy after 17 years of cigarette smoking of giving it up. Right. It took me 10 years to implement the policy. Right. So just by way of illustration. Right. Okay, so some people are weak-willed, <laughs> but I eventually got there. Okay, so um, if they carry the resolution, if they carry the resolution, then it becomes their policy, and then part of that is that they convey that to national government, right? So it wouldn't be difficult to then get them to write a letter setting setting that out, and that would be part of our request. Okay, and we also then use that and publicise that. Right, in terms of our propaganda, right, right, and publicity. Yes, on a number of occasions. And so, on like on that, um, what's happened is a number of councils have said we prefer not to do it, not to do the twelve-point resolution ourselves, because we do not have enough resources to investigate properly this issue, right. And so, you can think about the smaller councils and. You know, they'll have a couple of poly policy analysts and an environmental officer and this and that, and they've got very busy officers, and then trying to divert resources to get some them to then go and study TPP and come up with a comprehensive position about that might be asking a bit too much. And so some of them have said um, that they'd actually prefer that local government New Zealand take that issue up on their behalf. And there a number of them have written to local government New Zealand about that. And, and when Christchurch carried its resolution, it said not only adopt the resolution and send that to government, but also tell local government New Zealand 
to adopt the same position. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there was a discussion right, amongst the, if you like, the TPP brain, Brains Trust. So anything, any idea has got a Brains Trust and there's a bit of a Brains Trust that operates. And we had a bit of a backwards and forwards in about that. But at that point in time, we only had five councils out of 78 who adopted our position, plus there's a couple of other councils that have adopted other resolutions as well, expressing concern. They were uh, Palmerston North, Horizons Regional Council, um, Greater Wellington Regional Council, Horofanua District Council, and more recently, in July of last year, um, Whanganui District Council, after a big fight with that council. Now, um, um, the thing that we perceived is that local government New Zealand wouldn't have seen that that was an overwhelming weight of numbers, right, in terms of their politics, to get the right sort of policy coming out of anything that they did. And once they put a line in the sand and said, this is our stance on it, right, then we would probably be stuck with that and we'd get a lot of resistance from councils to our approach in respect to the 12-point resolution. Right? So understanding that dynamic, right, or the sheer politics of the situation, I, in particular, argued that we don't push the local government New Zealand thing too much. We keep working in the field and getting other councils to adopt it so that we can try, we make it a fact on the ground. Okay? And, um, and so I, like I've put my time and energy, I haven't worked for a living now since um, early last year. Uh, I've just been focusing in on this project. Um, and it, it's, not, it's not a chore, or well, sometimes it is, but, <laughs> but it's like I'm, I volunteer, I'm very happy about it, um, and you know, it's quite good for me in terms of growth and learning and all the rest of it, and I get to meet all these wonderful people everywhere, you know, so. You know, it's all good. You know? and, and I guess my skills grow as a result of that, like in terms of personal development. So, you know, there's lots of wins in it for me as well. Um, so, um, like, yeah. but there are moves now, like just in the last week or so, uh, whereby local government New Zealand's hands being forced and they are actually meeting, so their boss, Lawrence Yule, from Hast who's the Mayor of Hastings District Council, is meeting with Tim Grosser, the um, Treaty Negotiations Minister, uh, in Auckland, apparently on the, t on the 7th, I think it is, of April. Uh, I think it's the 7th. I think it's the 7th, anyway. So, um, so they're having a meeting, okay? Now, goodness knows what's gonna be discussed in that meeting. Now, a couple of things about Lawrence Yule. So, like, this is, you've got to have this part of the picture too. If you've got that other bit, you, then you need to have it all weighed up. Lawrence Yule, right, is the Mayor of Hastings District Council, and there is an amalgamation proposal between Hastings District Council, Napier Council, and the surrounding district. And <coughs> you would no doubt be aware of the Super City proposal in Wellington as well. And there's a lot of upsetness in some of the councils and the communities and our mate, Ray Wallace, at Hutt City Council and his council have led the charge against that, right? And um, so he's very prominent. And so when he was talking uh, in respect to our TPP policy, just when it was passed the other day, he was talking about democracy and how the councils need to represent their communities. Okay? Right? And that's like his argument, because he's been sort of the, the public figure that's in opposition to Fran Wild, who's been pushing the pr the pro amalgamation thing. Okay, so over in in Hastings, right, Lawrence Yule is the Fran Wild, right, and Napier Council is the Hutt City Council, if you like, in opposition. Okay, and Napier Council, there was a proposal to amalgamate those two councils maybe six or eight years ago or something like that, and. Um, uh, by a majority, Hastings Council voted for it, but by an overwhelming majority, Napier Council voted against it. Now, since then, there's been a rule change, or they've changed the law in the Local Government Act. Right? So the Local Government Act 2002 right, um, was amended in 2012 
to make amalgamations more easily. So no longer, no longer does the local government commission need to get a majority in each of the participating councils. It can get an overall majority, right, in order to force the amalgamation through. Okay. So that is all designed to undermine the local democracy and the people's abilities to choose who they join. Okay? And Lawrence Yule right, is a strong proponent of amalgamations. Right? And there's an overall plan floating around somewhere to amalgamate all of New Zealand's 78 councils into about 19 super councils. Okay? which is going to make it extremely difficult for local people to get access to, in a proper way, to their councils. Okay? But I don't want to go into the whole local government thing. It's problematic, in my view. It's not being properly thought of. Except it also it means that, like, with Auckland, which is a super city in itself now, I mean, they have, like, large budgets for roading and for hospitals and for water and for everything else. And so if you've got the councils all pushed into one super thing, then corporations and anyone who's interested in carving out the public estate has only got one office to go and annoy, rather than in Wellington where they've got to go and annoy six, or if you go into the Wairarapa, nine councils altogether. Okay. So in a sense, having the many different councils is a bit of a protection, right? because it means it's easier for us to keep an eye on what's going on and it's harder for, for large corporations to come in and take over our public estate. Okay. So Lawrence Yule, not only that, not as only is he a, a proponent of uh, amalgamations, right? he's also by, I mean I haven't spoken to him myself, but by anecdotal evidence, right, that is other people's stories, I've heard that he's not really keen on our TPP policy. So that was another reason not to be wanting that to be addressed by them in any way, shape or form too early. It also probably means that he's not a very strong advocate for us when he meets with Tim Grosser on the 7th of April. Okay? So there's some scuttlebutt, like with some emailing and chatting going back and forth about how we deal with that, and so what we will be doing probably, like we haven't made a firm decision, we'll be getting in touch with the mayors and councils that have already carried out TPP policy and some of the others, and see if they can get them certain their noses in there to make sure that whatever local government's doing, local government New Zealand's doing in respect to that meeting with Grocer, they're properly representing and being advocates on our behalf. Okay, so, I mean, so, Maybe that, that's covered all of that sufficiently. And so maybe what we'll now do is go to um, New Zealand first. Uh, oh, sorry, Mo. Uh -huh. Oh, OK, in terms of the overall time. Yeah. You're happy for me just to keep talking? Yeah. Yeah. Right, OK. So with... Um, with um, OK, so we've got a couple of things going on in terms of the ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement. Okay, so with that, this is the real problem, right? Because that could probably restructure everything by itself in that corporations over time can rewrite the rule book or limit our government to be able to look after our public interests, right? Whether it's health, environment or whatever else. Okay, so that's already proven. The evidence is in, the case is closed. Okay, so it's what we do about it, okay? So... <clears throat> So we, we in It's Our Future and TPP Action have been gearing up to run a campaign against the ISDS clause in the New Zealand Korea Free Trade Agreement. Okay? Now, I haven't looked at the It's Our Future website. No, I did today, but it's not up there yet. In the next couple of days, maybe this week, I'm not sure, there will, when you go to that website, there will be an alert which takes you... right to a point where you can make a submission, or what they call a submission, I don't like that word because I have to bend over, but I call it evidence paper or put in my view or whatever else, but you can, you know, whatever, they call it a submission anyway. So you can make a submission to the select committee and you can say, no, I don't want ISDS in the New Zealand Korea Free Trade Agreement. 
we want everyone to do that not only that we want everyone to say i want to appear right we want to jam it up right now appearance could be in wellington or it could be done by skype or phone or something like that we'd really like it that there were so many people doing it that they have to come and bring the select committee out into the countryside but we'll see what happens okay <laughs> But we want to jam that up. But also, there's been some discussions <coughs> between the Green, the, the New Zealand First, and the Greens, and it's our future, okay, about a bill before the Parliament to stop ISDS. And for political reasons, it was chosen that we let New Zealand First carry that, okay? okay? Because the Greens are always seen as knocking everything, whereas New Zealand First. Right, it's a slightly different story, okay, more middle of the road, attract grey power and all the rest of it, you know, so like it's like, you know, I mean, one has to be shrewd when, when one is doing all this sort of stuff. So, so New Zealand First member, Fletcher Tabato, who's the Rotorua or the MP for around the Rotor area, because I think that's where he comes from, um, he put a, a member's bill, a private member's bill into the ballot about a month ago. Right? And it's the countering foreign, fo uh, foreign corporation or corporate control bill. Countering, no, fighting, fighting foreign corp. I'll just have a drink of water. <coughs> okay, fighting, let's settle. Fighting foreign corporate control bill. Now that bill basically says New Zealand cannot sign up to a free trade agreement that's got ISDS in it, full stop. Right, now if that passed through the parliament, that would stop the Korea free trade agreement and TPP dead in its tracks as far as New Zealand's concerned. Because, remember back I told you, in order for an international treaty to be carried or to be adopted or assented to, they have to rearrange the domestic legislation to make it work. Now, if the domestic legislation says you can't have ISDS, and both of those have got ISDS in it, no deal. Can't be assented to. Okay? So this is really important. Okay? Now, it's funny, because someone must be looking after us. It's only been sitting in the ballot for a month. Okay? And then on the 9th, Thursday, it's every two weeks, Thursday, private members' bills get drawn out. If there's a space on the paper, pop, out it comes. It's like Christmas, eh? Only on the night of the 5th. Okay, so, so that's now out there and active, right? It's got to get through its first reading and then it will go to a select committee and then we can all bound in on that one as well, right? Okay, and get involved. But it's got to get through its first reading. Now, currently, the national government's got the numbers with ACT, with Peter Dunn. Okay, so what can we do? Well, it's funny, there's a by-election in Northland which will alter the numbers again, possibly. So everyone's going to be watching their TVs or radios or whatever else and find out whether... Winston Peters gets to be a hero again. Right. Now you guys all know about Winston Peters because he, this was the first place that he had, um, um, like he, like this is his base and where he came from, isn't it? So it's quite interesting. Um, um, anyway, so good luck to Winston and hope he makes it through and hope that he is elected. So Labor is apparently laid down in the election and the Greens have laid down in the election, da 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 hopefully it gets up. Because what we need for that bill, the ISDS bill to be passed, we need not just NZ First and the Greens, we need Labor, we need Maori Party, We need the Labor Party, we need the Labor Party, we need the Labor Party, we need all the Labor Party to vote for it. And we probably wouldn't hurt if we had the Act guy as well. And there's a bit of a story that he might, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, because they um, I mean, they're quite libertarian and all the rest of it, but they, they still have this quaint notion about, this quaintly patriotic, the Act Party. 
in some perverse way. And because there was previously a bill before the parliament in 2002-03 called the International Treaties Bill, and that was advanced by the Greens and ACT, right? And that was about taking the, um, the any international treaties, trade treaties, out of um, the cabinet and making them uh, to be fully dealt with by the parliament, right? Which would make that a parliament would have to make a full decision about them rather than the cabinet making the decision, right? So this is a roundabout way of answering your question, sir, but like these are all the elements that are in the fire, if you like, uh, which could bring about a good solution for our problems. And even if that all falls over, we've still got to keep campaigning on the job or, you know, in, in our in um, in our cities and our towns and, and more rallies and all the rest of it. But so this is very important, right? And it's very important that people get behind, okay, the submissions to the select committee in, res in respect to the New Zealand Career Free Trade Agreement. So go to the It's Our Future website and have a look at that. In respect to the um, the ISDS bill, when that comes up, right? But the thing that needs to happen there is just people have to lobby their local members, right? Because it's the parliamentarians that will make that decision. So if you've got any ends with local MPs, whether they be national or whatever, right? Go and annoy buggery out of them, right? Okay, that's very important. Um, okay, sir, you were going to ask a question. Sorry. Oh, okay. I, yeah, Peter Dunn. I don't know, but when I go back to Wellington, in any spare time that I have, I will be annoying him. But I'll be annoying the Labor guys as well, right? Um, because yeah, we. we we, we really need all of these people now to come to the party and stick and stand up for New Zealand, right, for who and what we are. Okay. So I think um, I could probably talk a little bit more, but I think that's enough of a report and it might be, uh, it might be good that people um, then can just have a general sort of chitter chat, ask questions and all the rest of it. I appreciate your patience and all the rest of it and, um, and thank you very much and thank you for your um, patience and and good listening. Thank you very much. Anyone? Um, do you see this as a, with what's happening with the councils and the super cities? Yeah. This is just a mini version of what TPP is, isn't it? And it's that TPP is going to take away our sovereignty by creating an an undemocratic, mess, bureaucratic run machine um, with the help of the corporations. Yep. Super cities are exactly the same. Super cities are spending money hand over fist and to hell with the consequences and to hell with all democracy. So I see that all the super cities, is, all they're doing is they're getting ready for TPP to come in. It's um, enabling them to come in and hide them Okay, the, la the, larger, the larger agenda is called neoliberalism. Yes. Okay, the larger, so these are all different components of neoliberalism. Um, it's, it's turning our governments into more and more corporations who have very, very narrow focuses and that's about bottom line outcomes. Mm -hmm. So when, when local government, when, when, when our national government reviewed the Local Government New Zealand Act, 2002 Act, uh, the purposes, the upfront purposes of that Act were that um, the government looks after the well-being of the people and it mentioned four well-beings. Okay? So those four well-beings are the, um, the um, uh, uh, social, environmental, economic and cultural uh, welfare of the populations or constituencies. Okay, so that was what the Act had up front. That was what the purpose of local government was. It wasn't about making money, right? It was about creating balance, right? And obviously wholesome community, right? If you're looking after the, um, the, the social needs, right? So welfare needs of people, you're looking after the economic needs, 
if you're looking after the environmental needs, and after all, economy is a subset of the environment, right? You've got to stuff the environment, you're not going to be happy in terms of your economy. <coughs> and the fourth thing is cultural, right? So, you know, like the civic space, the, 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 the money for the arts to brighten the place up, right? The, the you know, the, 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 the fact that we have, you know, open, you know, libraries and things like that so people can inform themselves and engage in things. All of this was in the purposes of the Local Government Act and our government, right, stripped that out despite every council opposing it, right, every council to what my understanding opposed them being taken out of the Act. Not only that, the Human Rights Commission, right, the government's own Human Rights Commission opposed them being taken out of the Local Government Act. Everyone opposed it. But they went ahead and they did that. So it's neoliberal agenda and it's about bottom lines. And the same thing, they can control 19 councils easier than they can control 78. Okay. And then if you go into the larger agenda, um, someone just told me, like people just keep popping things into my mind at different points in time. I guess I'm a synergy, I just carry a lot of stuff that people have popped into me or that I've found that other people will do. And and so what someone offered to me not so long ago, only in the last couple of days, is they remember a reference to the World, uh, to the world Trade Organisation where <coughs> it was said that the World Trade Organisation was being set up as the de facto government of the world. So people talk about this new world order thing and all the rest of it, okay? It really is the old order, right? It's the privileged class, the bloody lords of the manor and all the dukes and all the rest of it who used to sit there and have all their serfs working away hard and dying at 40 with sore backs and everything else, right? They're reinstituting that. So the new world order is the old world order. In the immediate post-war period, there was a whole lot of wealth and wiped out in after the Second World War. The world was opened up. And so there was all this rights-based stuff came out with the UN and all the rest of it. The UN it was to be our planetary government, right? But it was set up under false bases because they set up the Security Council which gave certain powers the right to veto good things. And the General Assembly of the 200 nations can't make a decision which sticks and has effect, right? And in the meantime, they defunded it. So even though it's got all these wonderful policies and everything else in it, right, it has been undercut, right, and corrupted from that point of view. In the meantime, they've set up these other things. And it's the World Trade Organization that is running out all of this agenda about free trade and investment agreements. And so TPP is just one handle, the other handle is the TTIP between the United States and Europe. Right? And there's another arrangement that's been negotiated through Eurasia involving China, <coughs> India and others. Okay. Now, they, because these things are going to overthrow our laws, right, these will be the new constitutions for the world. And they are all based on money. Nothing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So this is very topical, given that we are now in World War One, one hundred, right? The hundredth anniversary. And on the twenty-fifth of April, we will be celebrating and calling out, lest we forget. And what is it that we are being forbid to forget? What is it that we are being forbid to forget? And this brother here has given us the answer, right? We're after democratic, liberal, civic, socially amenable spaces and other people are doing other things to us, okay? So, and they're doing that because all they can see is dollars. Right? Okay, so it's not in our interest, but anyway, you all know that. So, thank you. Anyone else? Um, I don't really know much about this, but I'm hearing you know, about undermining sovereignty. Dumb question. Why are so many governments so happy to let that happen? Okay.
okay, so... It's a very good question. So what's been happening is there's been a progressive implementation of these things. So it's a bit like boiling frogs. Do you understand the boiling frog concept? Okay, so people might put frogs in a pot of cold water and put it on a stove, right, and then turn the heat up and it's just gently warming up, warming up, warming up, warming up. And the frogs are still staying in the pot and they're not realising that they're being slowly boiled until it's too late and they're dead. Okay? Now... That's what's happened with our governments because they've been, if you like, corrupted by this neoliberal agenda which our friends the Labor Party facilitated in bringing in in 1984, right? And, um, and which certain elements of them are still seem to be enamoured of, okay? And it may well be what's going on in the world but most of the people in the world aren't interested, right? Now... It's not just Kiwis that are upset about TPP. There's people in Japan, there's people in Vietnam, there's especially people in the USA. So if you get across the social media pages in terms of TPP, they're going nuts over there in certain places in the USA. Like in Korea, they're very interested in what's going on in terms of this free trade agenda as well. Like so it's, and particularly in Europe where they've got the TTIP. Now Germany, and France are both indicating that they don't want ISDS as well. Okay? Germany's been burnt because they, in the aftermath of Fukushima, took a national decision that they're going to phase out their nuclear power plants. Now, the Swedish company that's maintaining and operating the power plants is now suing under ISDS the German government in respect to that decision. Right? The Germany say, well, we're not going to have ISDS if it's going to stop us from taking policy decisions that we want in our best interests. So, um, South Africa is saying they're not going to support it. You know, there's various others that are doing. Australia, currently, if you have a look at... Like, I haven't had a chance to read too much in the last few days. I've been sort of, like, a bit nuts. So I haven't really looked at the stuff that's come out about the, the, the latest leaked investment chapter. But I, from the quick glance... Uh, of the ISDS clause, which is part B of it, um, Australia is bracketed, and so that means Australia is still disputing as to whether or not it will accept ISDS. That was as of January of this year. Okay, right. So we've got some support there. I mean, instead of us rolling over and playing dead, we should be more alive and saying no, we're not going to accept it. You know? Now, but like we've got a number of things that are in train to try and stop that, like the bill. Um, like what's happening in Northland, like what we're doing with uh, opposing those provisions in the career agreement. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it is sovereignty sapping, um, but we've, we've given up, like to put this in con perspective, we've given up sovereignty before because we've agreed to other agreements, like international treaties. We agreed to an international tr treaty about the Convention Against Torture We've agreed to a convention in respect to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. In each of those, we're actually giving up sovereignty because we're actually giving up our sovereign ability to be despots. Yeah, I know, it's very good. So, in some sense, sometimes giving up sovereignty is a good thing. Now, if there was a TPP which was good and in the public interest, right? Right? and would have the effect of having free and fair trade and looked after all our interests and the interests of the other 12 nations, well, all the 12 nations' peoples, and had, might have the situation where it might cause none of those nations to go to war against each other, then that might be a good thing. And on balance, we might say, yes, we'd be prepared to accept a, a loss of so sovereignty because we're doing that for the greater good. It's just like us in terms of our agreement not to go and punch up our neighbour because, you know, our sovereign right to punch up our neighbour, right, is a bit naughty, you know, so like, you know, so like everything in context, but right now what they're asking us to do is no good for us, right, and no good for the nation in my view. Sorry, Tracy. No, but, but what you're saying is important because that's what, there was a lovely little lady last night at the talk. Was anyone at the talk last night? Yeah. Yeah, I was um, so they're talking about genetically modified food and the effect on our gut and round up and all those effects. And um, so a little bit of this discussion came up for a few minutes and part of, you know, a little old lady says, 
But Tim Gross is a lovely man, and he's doing a great job, and he's, you know, it's good for exports, and New Zealand runs on exports. If we didn't have exports, we'd collapse, and it would just be dreadful, and it's like, well, actually, the paradigm is incorrect, because there are lots of people out there in the world who don't, you know, give up their sovereignty and can still run their country. So our paradigm is we can't make money, we can't run our country without exports. So that's what's driving a lot of what we're doing you know, those free trade agreements. So I would, my, I would respectfully suggest to the government that actually they've got, it's all back to front. So they don't realise that we could do all, well they do realise, sorry, but they don't realise that we could do all of this without overseas funding. So we don't actually need to destroy our environment. So I ran for election last, um, election last year on this platform of social credit instead of social debt, which is how we're running our country at the moment. So once we can start running, changing the way we run the financial, you know, our monetary authority in New Zealand, then none of this matters because we don't need money from overseas to run our country. So because we're, because we're running this paradigm, that's why we're in this conundrum at the moment of this having to go cap in hand to a foreign country. Oh, okay. So that's the government's argument? No, that's not <laughs> no, no, the argument really is that if we're not in this agreement, we're out. And so we're not going to be making money uh, from our dairy and from our... So, you know, I would say, well, actually, we don't need that. We can actually find um, uh, countries who will do business with us. Can I, can I, without, without that agreement. Just to follow that up, it's a very important point that Trace has made, like in terms of how... Um, They've monopolised the creation of money, and and um, <clears throat> basically set up their own body is the only one that can issue money. Like that, nations can uh, spend amongst their 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 um, communities. Okay. Now our government has a fit, uh, has a reserve bank, and it could issue notes. Uh, and create money in the in the economy, so that we've got sufficient money to go around and money velocity to ensure that we don't have these things called recessions happening all the time. Right? And they, the amount of money that is um, allowed to operate in the economy could be adjusted up or down based on what's going on um, um, in the economy itself. Now. <coughs> Um, so these are other policies, right, that won't even get an air if we go into TPP, right? right? So because TPP is about creating this, this just one dry set of rules which only look after large corporate interests, okay? okay so this is very important to understand. The other thing as part of that is... Um, I didn't want to go into a big history lesson, but if you go back and have a look, like, I, I went back to 1840, okay, let's go back a little bit further. Okay, the New Zealand Company, okay? So when the New Zealand Company came to New Zealand, and I'm an Aussie, I come from the West Island, right? <laughs> so I have to read history in order to learn what was going on here, eh? So I can come and talk to you guys about history. <laughs> okay, so what New Zealand Company came out here and they settled four centres and they brought out these guys that had boot, bootloads of money and then they brought out a whole lot of other people from England, and you've got to remember in England it was all austerity there, like people were like starving, that's why they came to New Zealand half a world away on a punt. And they were told that they were going to have as much employment as they want and really good wages. So when they get here, there's nothing. <laughs> oh, well, you're here now? Ah, oh, right. Well, is there some work? No, we've got it all covered. Oh, okay. And so what they had was is they had a surplus of labour all the time, so there was no pressure on, on wages, right? And so that it meant that the, the, the lords of the manor, that is the people that bought up all the land around Otago and, you know, other places around, the Tony... Yeah, huh? We're it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Took it, yeah, however they got it, right? Um, they then had lots of um, cheap labour, right, to run their bit, run their um, pastoral industries and all the rest of it. So that's sort of like the basis that the white guys came in and colonised the place. Okay, um, 
Now, th those, those interests, pastoral interest and finance interest, have been driving New Zealand's economic policy settings ever since, right? Now, in 1935, we had a Labor government, okay? And that Labor government put in place a full employment policy. And they ran that full employment policy from 1935 to 1949, and then they got turfed out, okay, and got replaced by nationals. When they, and they started to turn that policy back. But largely, what happened was there was industry development, right? So we were looking to create industries here so that we could do skills formation and all the rest of it and build up people's, yeah, and build up people's skills and also give them opportunities to get decent wages, okay? Now, that policy has been turned over and we've gone back to the financialisation of the economy and everyone's trying to drive wages down to the bottom, right? So we run in New Zealand an economic policy setting that says there's always 6% unemployed. And this is a government that's looking after our interests. And not only that, if I'm unemployed, right, for no fault of my own, then I'm an arsehole and a doll bludger. Yeah. Right? And you can't look right? No, no. Now, now I, I may not be an arsehole, for instance, right now, like I'm voluntarily not going to work. I'm leaving my space for someone else. I might like sitting at home and watching the TV or playing fucking games or whatever else, right? And someone else who really wants that job is able to go and get it. But no, right? I'm going to be castigated and kicked until I go out there and pinch that other person's job in a very tight labour market where there's no jobs. So the policy settings that are established here are absolutely crazy when you think about it. Now, another policy that the Democrats for Social Credit have is a universal basic income. You should Google universal basic income and have a look at that. We could probably have a 500 bucks goes into everyone's bank account, right? Bang, you can get rid of wins, you can get rid of old day pensions, you can get rid of a whole lot of stuff and, ha and heaps of layers of government. Now that would streamline everything, but that would also mean that we could be creative, we could not have to go to work if we didn't want to. If we want to go to work, we do. And we could you know, foster our own businesses. We could develop ourselves as human beings. And if we went back to that old policy of free education that got thrown out with neoliberalism and the Labor Party in 1984, right? People could be advancing themselves through universities and all sorts of things. So like all these policy settings, like if they've been happened in the past, they can happen in the future. But we need to get back to democracy and make sure that we have, you know, like we've got the policies to make that happen. Okay?